Hi, I'm Mike Salmon, the Senior Vice President of Games here at Maggot, and I am joined by... Kirsten Madsen. I am a qualitative analyst here, um, and I notably was the lead moderator for our Knowledge Core study. As we talked about last time on, on part one, if you miss it, this is part two. We're talking about community and how important community is in the world. And just like the world around us, a community isn't always perfect. And trying to really dig into that, we got a special group um, among the others of uh, female and non-binary gamers to really dig into some of the issues and concerns and differences. And then a lot of this was supported by our quantitative work as well. Um, so I'll have Kirsten talk about that for us. So like Mike said, you know, community is this enormous part of any service game and any game in general where, you know, people who are playing the game want to be part of something that's positive and that's adding to their experience. And as we all know, as gamers, community can is not always an additive. And sometimes community toxicity or negative experiences with the community within a game can negatively affect the experience, whether it's, you know, getting flamed for being bad when you are playing a game for literally the first time, uh, or if you've been a seasoned player for decades and you talk on voice chat and you are a woman and people do not like that. So this is just something that happens in games, whether it's because of, you know, the culture, <laughs> how culture in general is, uh, the unique problems caused by anonymity, um, and just kind of some of the undercurrents of toxicity that have just been in been a part of the gaming community for a very long time. So in our knowledge for study, we did find some interesting things that differentiated female and non-binary gamers from a what people might view as the more traditional male gaming audience. And we saw, we talked about all of these levels of community from the macro game community. So everyone who's in a game world having these experiences together to micro communities where you are having experience with your friends, your close community um, and navigating that larger world together. So we saw that a lot of tactics have been employed by female and non-binary gamers and any gamer that has encountered toxicity. I think everyone has had an experience like this. Um, I vividly remember my first experiences with, with toxicity in communities as a young child. <laughs> but you kind of deal, you have strategies that you can employ. Um, some of those strategies are supported by the game itself. The game can give you tools to have the kind of experience that you're interested in having, whether that's really specialized servers that help you play how you want, or whether that is, you know, making your game fully private, whether that is doing something very wise, like muting global chat, which you should always do. <laughs> um, there are these tools within the game that help you kind of counter and buffer against those negative community experiences. And there's also just the things that gamers, including especially female and non-binary gamers, the things that they have learned to do, that we have learned to do uh, to counter against those experiences. And one of the things that we saw come out in the qualitative research is having a close community around you of people that you talk to about games was a really strong, you know, support and protection layer against negative toxicity experiences in games. So when female and non-binary gamers were moving around gaming communities, they tended to do this in small groups rather than on their own. And we, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why that might be. One of them, kind of how we started talking about this was about you know, whether you find community in a game or around a game. So when you, we talked to the more traditional male dominated groups, you started to hear a lot about, um, like I, I joined the game and I can feel, I feel belonging, I feel accepted. I don't have problems. If I do have problems, they're fleeting. If a male gamer can join a game and feel community, feel belonging, they can do that by themselves. They can do that with friends, it's their choice. And we have a statistic in our knowledge core that, you know, the game itself dying is a big problem for male gamers, where they'll stick with the game until the community within the game dies. And that was less of a problem for female and non-binary gamers, especially in our qualitative research. Like the game can be, you know, it's not the out the inside the game community that's the big thing. It's, you know, if my friends are into it, I can play that game. And it's more important that my friends are into it than that everyone online is into it or everyone on Twitch is into it or it's the hot new game right now. This armor that they put on themselves with this friend group so they can move to the games they want to play um, is really important to business-wise because if you're thinking about a community, do you want to lose people because they can't bring their armor with them? 
um, obviously making a better place for people to play games is something we all want to do. And it's just the right thing to do. But seeing this as an actual fact of data of people moving away from games because of this is really important, especially when we look at the world. You know, Gen Z, 50% of the Gen Z gamers are female and non-binary, right? That's a huge portion. And remember, like 85 to 90% of Gen Z all play games. So it's a huge portion of gamers in the future. And it's something that as an industry we really need to solve and figure out. Yeah, totally. And it's it's leaving money on the table. And in this world where there are so many options for gaming, like not only traditional service games, but seeing games as spaces and public squares rather than just like a game that you play and put down. Um, these are places where people are meeting and communing and connecting with each other. And if they have negative community experiences in one of these games or spaces, they will leave. They will vote with their feet and they'll go somewhere that either has a community that is more supportive and positive or has the tools that they need to make it a community that is supportive and positive. So it is crucial that this is you know, addressed. I think this is not a new problem by any means. Like I mentioned, this has been going on for decades and decades and you know, millennia, all of human history. <laughs> And it's just understanding how the people that we talk to in these groups are lifelong gamers and the way they talk about their both their early childhood experiences with games and the experiences they have now um, just reflect that this is toxicity and sexism and misogyny and all of this is, is a real problem in gaming that has, you know, we've lost people. We've lost people who will never play a game again because of this. So the more we can keep Gen Z engaged and excited about what's coming up in the gaming world, the better and richer the future of games will be. Yeah, th thanks, Kirsten. That's really interesting. We had a really good discussion group and a lot of data to back this up. Part three coming up is going to be about content, another C of a great games relationship. There is a link down below. Uh, click on that. We'll update you when the next one hits. We're always happy to go through this uh, with anyone. And, and we try to do diversity work in all of our projects because I think it's really important to this industry. So thanks so much for tuning in and have a good one.